May the peace of God be with you. Let us worship God together. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Ecclesia. We are so thrilled that you chose to worship with us today. I am um, still putting my drink down, so there's that. Um, from wherever you are, we have um, people here in our space, but we also have some people online. Who's online with us today, Jay? Olivia, Kim, and Dawn, welcome. We're glad you're here. We also have people watching this afternoon or tonight or this week sometime online, and we welcome those into our space as well. We also welcome right here with us our friends who are worshiping at La Vaita at the Rivers of Living Water Church today. Uh, we welcome them into our space just as they welcome us into theirs. We also remember those who are working, worshiping at First Baptist Church of Matanzas, where Stan and Kim uh, worship regularly when they are there. They are not there today. They are at a church in Holguin, whose name I have forgotten, um, and they will be traveling home this week. So we speak them into our presence as they prepare to leave. It is hard to leave Cuba. So please be in prayer for them this week as they make the transition from there back home to here, from their home there to their home here. Are there others you'd like to speak into our presence? Ashley and David. Ashley and David. Ann and Eddie. The rest of the Perez family, um, Lupe is working today. And so um, we miss her, but are grateful that she has her work. And Carla, yes, Carla's also working as uh, in the same field. They're both working in, as nursing assistants now. So, Well, wherever you are, however you chose to join us today, we welcome you as we worship God together. Beginning with our first hymn. 37. Number 37.
Our psalm reading this morning is Psalm 15. When I was, uh, uh, many years ago, I attended the funeral of uh, one of my wife's uncles, who was also one of my favorite people. And this scripture was read as his favorite psalm, and I read it quite often, and it's become my favorite psalm also. So Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live in your holy hill? He who, whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man, who despises a vile man, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, who lends his money without usury and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. This is the word of the Lord. I love it when that happens. Thank you, Jerry. As we begin our time of prayer, we start, as we always do, with some good news. Beginning today with the good news that our own Kim Dotson has achieved her uh, National Teachers uh, Certification. No small feat, and that is good news. We are excited for Kim um, that she's completed this goal and uh, celebrate with her. That's good news. But there's more good news. Uh, I'm going to open it right now and tell you what that is. Uh, Also, I learned this week about uh, a situation in India that makes me very happy. I don't know if y'all know that I really like rhinos. If you've been to my house, I have lots of little rhinos and stuff around my house. They're my favorite land animal. And uh, other than, you know, beagles. Um, So, in India, in the Indian state of Assam, the, the manager there, the, the chief minister there, set a goal of being, of having rhinos no longer poached by 2023. And in 2022, that state reported no rhinos poached in the entire year. This is a huge problem. I mean, I realize not many of you are on the cutting edge of rhino research. However, um, rhinos are very, uh, they're, they're herbivores. They're, they're kind animals. They are very, they're just really big. And so they don't have any uh, natural enemies except for humanity. And so the fact that, that they put a, a, into this poaching is really good news. There are about 3,000 rhinos in that area. And most of that 3,000 live in the areas that are protected. And so I was really excited about that. I suppose you are too now. Um, Dana sent me this little piece of good news. A little 20-pound poodle mix named Ryu was found um, struggling in the French broad. This was from Asheville. And these two women saw the poodle get swept into the Um, current and one of them dived in to save this little dog and she she succeeded in catch getting the little guy and getting him help and he is now living with a foster family and is going to be just fine so thanks be to uh Ryu and to uh Sarah Stapleton um they found Ryu's uncle uh, the owner uh, wonderful possibly not his uncle we don't know the the uh, exact relationship. Good news, good news. And finally, I learned about this um, happening in Tennessee, in Hendersonville, Tennessee. This engineering class, this is remarkable. If you all ever think that we have trouble with the youth today, y'all need to pay closer attention because this is a group of high school kids who went to school with a guy who was born with only one hand. And they said in their engineering class, I bet we could fix that. And those kids, proving that you can learn anything on the internet, studied plans that they downloaded from the internet on how to make an artificial hand. They 3D printed it 
and made multiple models, making corrections. And now, for the first time in his life, the young boy, whose name is Sergio, can catch a ball with his right hand. Uh, it actually works, and and he's got, and they can make multiple uh, copies of it because it's 3D printed. Isn't that amazing? Yes, I thought that was very good news. Um, so, always good to hear good news. For me, it's particularly good to hear good news this week. Um, we've heard more than enough about mass shootings in the last three weeks, um, month. This, um, to date, well, I don't know about today. This was last night that I checked. Um, we've, there have been 50 mass shootings which involved four or more people being shot this year in January. That's over uh, almost two shootings per day. 96 people have died from these mass shootings and 191 have been wounded. And I don't think anybody wants this to happen. So I think we need to stop with the dichotomies of us and them. No one wants this to happen. This is not a political issue. There is not a politician I know, a person on either side of the aisle who wants mass shootings to happen. No one wants this. In addition, we have been uh, invited to, hopefully you haven't accepted the invitation, to watch the videos of Tyree Nichols, a 29-year-old man who was the subject of police brutality. He was beaten by the police, and then three days later, he passed away. Um, nobody wants this to happen. There's no one on either side of the aisle. There's no one of any political belief in, that I know. Sure, you can go out to the far reaches and find some people, but it's rare. Most people don't want this to happen. So let's stop arguing about the exact, <coughs> let's stop saying these things that make us on opposite sides of the issue. We're all on the same side of the issue. No one wants this. No one wants gun violence in schools or, or grocery stores or synagogues or churches, for goodness sakes. And so as we come to our time of prayer today, I want us to pray specifically for justice. And when I say justice, I don't mean that people get their just desserts because Lord knows none of us want what we deserve. Amen. What I mean is that we pray that right is done, that we can have common sense answers to complicated problems. We put a person on the moon in the 70s. This is, this, we can do this. And so I looked up a person whose um, thoughts I expect, respect. His name is Father James Martin. He's a Jesuit priest. He wrote this prayer, which I bring to you today during our prayer time um, <coughs> for prayer, a prayer to end gun violence. <clears throat> Let us pray. Merciful God, we come to you heavy hearted, for we have heard the cries of the slain calling to us from the ground. We come remembering all the lives lost to the weapons of war that have flooded our communities. We come reminded of the many bodies locked in jails and prisons all across this country, and we ask for your mercy. <coughs> Although we find ourselves in a broken world, a world in which hurt, hurting people hurt other people, it is no mystery that you are a God capable of healing our world through justice and fairness. Your own revelation has shown us that you stand firmly with those people whose backs are against the wall. Your own life demonstrates how you came from heaven to earth to redeem creation, our own communities and our own lives. So we ask for this same redemptive power to be unleashed among us as if it were the day of Pentecost. May we be empowered by your spirit to reverse the conditions that produce young men and women 
who are driven to resort to violence and destructive behavior in their fight to stay alive and struggle to remain free. <coughs> we know that you have no pre pleasure in the death of anyone. So we boldly come to the throne of grace today, dear Lord, seeking your wisdom as we create strategies that provide pathways and lifelines to hope and healing. Help us to remember we are all your children, all of us created in your image. And we are connected by a single garment of mutuality and destiny. Cause us never to forget how our needs are the same and our calling to address these needs are the same. We cry out to you. Heal our sores, souls from this scourge of violence. Endow us with the courage to step down from the pulpits and out from behind our desk to seek the peace of the city. As our leaders debate solutions, Lord, we ask that you grant us the voice to speak truth to power and demonstrate sacrificial compassion to the hurting. Teach us your ways, O oh God. Bless us with the wisdom and strength to put down our swords and be peacemakers. Use us, work through us, and if necessary, work in spite of us to mend our nation's brokenness. We thank you for your protecting embrace and unfailing love. O oh God, of all the things on our minds today, we also have personal concerns, names that continue to linger on the edges of our minds. And so in this moment, oh God, we lift those names up to you and ask, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us pray as Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let's continue in worship as we sing our second hymn. Please stand. Number 23.
Okay. Guess what time it is? It's time for the children's story. You're gonna love this one, I'm just saying. This one's called The Rooster Who Would Not Be Quiet. And it was written by Carmen Agraditi and illustrated by Eugene Yelchin. That means Carmen Didi wrote the words. And Eugene Yelchin is the artist who drew these very fun pictures. Have you heard this one before? I think we've read this one before. I can't remember. Once there was a village where the streets rang with song from morning till night. Dogs bayed, mothers crooned, engines hummed, fountains warbled, and everybody, everybody sang in the shower. Everyone and everything had a song to sing. This made the village of La Paz a very noisy place. It, it was hard to hear, it was hard to sleep, it was hard to think, and no one knew what to do. So they fired the mayor. Now, they were a very noisy village without a mayor, so they held an election. Only Don Pepe promised peace and quiet. He won by a landslide. The next day, a very polite law appeared in the village square. No loud singing in public, por favor. Things were getting better already. But more laws soon followed. No loud singing at home. No loud singing. No singing. Be quiet already. Until finally, the noisy village of La Paz was as silent as a tomb. Even the tea kettles were afraid to whistle. Some people left the village singing loudly. Others stayed behind and learned to hum. The rest were just grateful to have a good night's sleep for crying out loud. Seven very quiet years passed. Then one evening, a saucy gilito and his family wandered into the village and roosted in a fragrant mango tree. When the little rooster awoke the next morning, he did what roosters were born to do. He sang. As his rotten luck would have it, the mango tree grew beneath the cranky mayor's window. Uh-oh. You there, groused Don Pepe. No singing, it's the law. Oh, that's a silly law, said the rooster. Smell this sweet mango tree. How can I keep from singing? Huh. Then I'll chop down that stinky tree, huffed Don Pepe. Will you sing then? The plucky rooster shrugged. I may sing a less cheerful song, but I will sing. And he did. Still singing, snapped Don Pepe. You have no tree, remember? I have no tree, said the galito, but I have my hen and chicks. How can I keep from singing? Will you sing if I throw you in a cage alone? Threatened Don Pepe. I may sing a lonelier song, said the stubborn Galito, but I will sing. And he did. Why are you singing now? growled Don Pepe. You have no hen and chicks. No hen and chicks, the Galito sighed. But I still have corn to eat. How can I keep from singing? And if you have no more corn, asked the mayor. I may sing a hungrier song, said the headstrong rooster, but I will still sing. And he did. Aren't you hungry, you crazy bird? Well, Don Pepe. Claro, of course, said the galito. But if the sun can still shine despite this world's troubles, how can I keep from singing? And if you never see the sun again, snarled the mayor and he ran for a blanket to cover the rooster's cage. I may sing a darker song, said the brave Galito, but I will sing. And he did. 
As the Galito song echoed down the soundless streets of La Paz, it stirred an old familiar longing for a time when everyone and everything had a song. Not so with Don Pepe, singing gave him indigestion. The next day, Don Pepe stumbled out to the yard in his night shirt. He tore away the blanket and pleaded, you have no tree to roost in, no hen and chicks to comfort you, no grain to fill your belly, no sun to drive away the shadows. Why, oh why, are you still singing? Please stop and I will set you free. One by one, a quiet crowd began to gather in Don Pepe's yard. I sing for those who dare not sing or have forgotten how, said the Galito. If I must sing for them as well, senor, how can I keep from singing? And if I made you into a soup, the mayor thundered, I suppose you'll sing if you're dead? The entire village held its breath, waiting for the Galito's reply. Dead roosters sing no songs. Ha! crowed Don Pepe, sure he would he had won. Even the radiators sing. But a song is louder than one noisy little rooster and stronger than one bully of a mayor, said the Galito, and it will never die, so long as there was someone to sing it. Pause. Once again, there was a village where the streets rang with song from morning till night. This made for a very noisy place to live. And that's just the way everyone liked it. The end. You know, not everybody has a song to sing, or at least they may have forgotten to sing it. But what we learned from Jesus is that we go wherever they are and we teach them how to sing and we learn what their song is and we sing it with them because God has put within each one of us a special song to sing. And it's our call to find a way to sing that song together. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for your gifts, your gifts of chickens and roosters who won't stop singing and of people who go find us when our songs have been lost and help us learn to sing again. We love you, Jesus. Amen. And now for our next story, open your Bibles to Micah. Micah is not Isaiah. Isaiah is towards the middle of the Bible. So go to Isaiah if you have your marker there from last week, but then keep going. Um, and you'll find Micah, a little bitty short book. Let's see. <laughs> Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. It's after Jonah. <laughs> Jonah, Micah, Nahum. All right. It's so small that it keeps, I keep passing over it. Micah 6, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear the mountains, the controversy of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people and he will contend with Israel. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what way have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Oh, my people. Remember what King Balak of Moab devised? What Balaam, son of Beor, answered him? And what happened from Shittim to Gilgal? That you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? 
with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? <coughs> Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh Lord, what is good. He has told you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Last week, we were in Isaiah as we were the week before that. And the first week, two weeks ago, we were looking at a passage that was written to people who had been taken to Babylon and then released and come back to an area that was very different for them than when they left. Then last week, we went back in time to a time when before Israel had been conquered by Assyria a time when they were still, Judah, the southern kingdom, was still trying to keep from being toppled by Assyria, a time when they were making um, allowances and, and, and uh, concessions to try to stay strong and not be beaten by the bully from the north. And that's where we are this week, too. Micah is speaking to a group of people who are living in a war-torn land. But Micah, he, he's not a, a soldier himself. Micah's a farmer. And he's poor. We know he was poor because we don't know anything else about him. If he had been a wealthy person, we would have had his lineage. But we don't have anything about him, except he was from Morasheth, wherever that is. And he uh, had a word to say about people who were oppressing the poor. In verse 2, in chapter 2, verse 2, Micah calls these people thieves. They covet fields and seize them, houses and take them away. They oppress householder and house people and their inheritance. In uh, 2.11, he says, if someone were going to go about uttering empty falsehoods, saying, I'll preach to you of wine and strong drink, such a one would be the preacher for this people. But in other words, you're not saying the right things. And then he goes on to um, verse chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. He says, You who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin off my people and the flesh off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin off them, break their bones in pieces, chop them up like meat in a kettle. Woo! He ain't playing around, is he? He says, You people who are oppressing the poor are this bad. And then you go, he says in verse four, and cry to the Lord about your problems. Micah has had enough. He's fed up. He's tired of seeing this mess. And so he has a word to say. And when we come to chapter six, if you're paying attention, then it could be confusing. Because there's a little bit of back and forth, and there's a little bit of, there's some words that probably not all of us recognize. So let's figure out what, what Mike is trying to say. First of all, it is a back and forth. Verses 1 through 5 have to do with God's message to, <clears throat> my, to the people through Micah. So it's like through Micah and then God's voice alone. Uh, hear what the Lord says. This is Micah speaking for the Lord. Rise, plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear the you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and so on. And then verse 3, you hear the Lord's voice. Oh, my people, what have I done? What, what have I done wrong? What, what do you need? <laughs> Tell me. Now, be careful, because we start to put our own tone of voice in this, and we make God kind of sarcastic if we're not careful. And we hear God saying, Good grief, what more do y'all want? Don't hear that. That's our voice. God, over and over again in Scripture, is indulgently in love with God's people. 
And so what voice you should hear here is the mother who's prayed and prayed and prayed for her child and goes to the child and says, what can I do? I did this and I did this and I did this. What can I do? That's the tone that God speaks to God's people here in verses three through five. And then humanity responds. And again, if you're not careful, you'll think um, that humanity says something like, well, what do you want from me? What do you want, 10,000 rivers of oil? What, you want me to give you my firstborn? No, 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 no. Be careful. Because every indication throughout the book of Micah is that the humanity responds in like manner to God. And humanity says, oh, man, I've done it this time. Oh, boy, what can I do? Um, what, if I, what if I come before you with burnt offerings? What about calves, a year old? I could do that. Um, okay, uh, maybe I just need to, like, bring 10,000 cows with that, do it. And then, then, I don't know, my firstborn. And God, oh, God is always so gentle. And God reminds humanity, says, he's told you. What does the Lord require of you? And, and just feel the, feel the mother embracing the son and saying, oh, sweet baby, you got it all wrong. I don't need all that stuff. I just, I just want you to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with God. That's it. And that's everything. Do you ever re need reminders that uh, God is on your side? God says in this text, he, he brings back memories of of things that God has done for God's people, like um, freeing them from slavery. And then King Balak of Moab was kind of a, a meanie who was oppressing God's people. And, and so, so God corrects the king through a, through a talking ass is what he does. And uh, so there's that story. And then, then he also says, remember what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, which is, which is uh, Israel's way of saying from Manteo to Murphy. When we say that in North Carolina, we mean the whole kitten caboodle, right? The whole shebang. So that means that God says, hey, I, I saved you and I got you across the river into a safe place. I got you across the, dead, the Red Sea and then I got you across the river Jordan, and now you're safe. So Jesus, I mean, God brings to mind these big miracles that God has done to, to save God's people because the people seem to have forgotten. And so I wonder, do you ever forget? Years ago, there was a big trend that, a grat, that you would keep a gratitude journal. Some of you may have done that, it's a great idea. The idea is that you list three to five things from that day that came to mind for which you were grateful. Things that you pause and say, hey, that's a gift. Uh, that's worth a moment of gratitude. The whole idea was this, that you would begin to nurture just an overall attitude of gratitude and you would begin to notice more things that were done for you. And it is a great idea. An even better idea, I think, is a witness journal. A journal where you record God's work in your life, lest you forget. In this uh, journal, you could write down the big things like God does here, and you probably have big things in your life that God has done for you. But my guess is those things don't happen every single day, just like these three things are like, you know, freedom from slavery, talking donkey, and uh, going across these very uh, huge barriers. Those are the big things. But what about the little things that God has done in your mind? What about those, those daily gifts of God's presence? Those times maybe that you were going to not go to the doctor's appointment, but then you decided you would go anyway, and the doctor found something that had you waited too long, 
it could have cost you. Those things like when you you wind up late and you never run late, but this time you wind up running late and sure enough, there's a car accident right at the spot where you would have been had you left on time. I mean, I'm not saying God orchestrates all of these things, but I'm saying we miss a whole lot that God does. So why not just give credit? Even if we're wrong, just give the credit anyway. There's also all of those times when you've been prompted to contact someone. This happens to me all the time that I just get a nudge. Oh, I wonder how my friend Andrea is doing. And I'll text Andrea and say, oh, I've got you on my mind. You're kidding. I just got back from the doctor. I'm going to have to have a surgery. Okay. This happens to me all the time, but I don't write it down. And I forget because it's so common in my life that happens so often that I forget. What if I were to write those things down? so that I could remember if I ever go through a dry spell when I can't seem to access God. And friends, if you've never gone through a time like that, well, you will. You're not, you're not Jesus. You'll have times when it's hard. What if we wrote those things down? I think that would be a great way to remind us of the work of God in our lives. But another great way is community. When we come together, and someone can say, you know, remember that time you, blah, blah, blah. Remember that time, God, such and such. Remember that time I felt God telling me to do this thing and I did it and remember, remember, remember. When we come together as community, we create a shared memory of the goodness of God. That's one of the many gifts of community. So God, God responds here and God says, what have I not done for you that you would be far off from me? And humanity is awash with awareness and humanity goes, oh, damn it, I did it again. It's like that time when somebody's sharing a difficult time in their life and you say, and they're trying to make a decision and you say, have you prayed about it? And they go, um, mm. Maybe I should do that. <laughs> you probably had that happen to you. I know I've had it happen to me when somebody has said to me, eh, have, what is God saying in your prayer life? Okay, I'm going to work on that. And humanity goes, nope, talk on it. I did it again. And God says, look, uh, I, I'm here. I'm doing things on your behalf. And humanity goes, ah. I'm, I'm not doing my part. I know it. I'm not doing my part. So I'll do a whole bunch of stuff. And honestly, we get it so wrong. We get it so wrong. We get it so, so wrong. And we start thinking that we need to do things like tally the number of people who wore their hat in church or condemn the number of people who stayed out too late or ran around too much or did this or did that. And we get so focused on that that in so far away from what God asks of us. And God says, here's what I want from you. And I just wonder, y'all, I just wonder if what God is doing here is calling us back to God, to who we were to start with calling us out of all that judgment and nitpicky stuff that we do so that we don't have to think about our own shortcomings. I wonder if God's just calling us back into who we were meant to be from the beginning. God says to do justice and oh, we kind of go, <laughs> I don't like to get political. I just stay out of that stuff. I just <laughs> don't want to do that. But God doesn't say that. God just says, do justice. And I just wonder, like, the Hebrew word here, darash, which is the Hebrew word for requirement, is really not do this. It's really more of a word that says, I invite you into this reality. It's like a mother's, a baby to a mother's milk. The baby is required to nurse is required, but also is drawn to it. And that's what Jesus is saying, God is saying here, 
Come into a life of justice because that's who you are meant to be. And then God says this. God says, um, love kindness. And for a long time, I thought, eh, well, we love kindness. Sure, everybody loves, who doesn't love kindness? But then I looked at the Hebrew, and this isn't love kindness. The word love is a verb, and it means have affection for, love, love as a verb. But then the word kindness is not kindness. The word kindness is hesed. It's the one that I have tattooed on my wrist. It's the word that means the love of God that saturates us so that we can be who we were meant to be. We are called to be drawn to that kind of love. That kind of love doesn't argue about doing justice because we are so full of love that we can't do any different than stand alongside the oppressed. And I know, I know it's hard to do justice. I know action is hard, but what if we just started with some things like paying attention? Like paying attention to where we shop. Are they paying a living wage? Are they so sourcing local goods? Are they treating their employees properly? What if we uh, started by using less stuff? Go to Cuba, it'll teach you, <laughs> use less stuff. What if we volunteered at a school, at a hospital, at a nursing facility, at a, at a prison? What if we wrote letters? Maybe we could join groups that are already in the process of fighting for justice. But doing justice also means giving people the benefit of the doubt. It means listening to others' stories and trusting them to tell their own story without you redacting, editing, changing it. Doing justice means being patient, being present. And, and if we love, we are full of God's love, then those things come naturally, they're automated. And then, then God says, the other thing is to walk humbly with God. And Terence Friedhelm, who is a great um, scholar of the prophets and the Old Testament in general, but he particularly loves the prophets, he said this, the orientation towards both God and neighbor in this pas passage is clear. Y'all heard that, right? Do justice, love kindness, be good to people, and then love God, follow God. You know, love God, love people. And he says, um, in effect, give yourself on behalf of others. Give yourself out of the love that is flowing from you. Give yourself on behalf of others. Do justice, love kindness, and at the same time, walk humbly or attentively. Pay attention to God. The walk with God has to do with life's journey and the shape thereof. That journey is God's call for action on behalf of the less fortunate. We, we take that call and join that call with the one to love each other deeply and committedly. Look, I, I don't know. I, I spend a lot of uh, sleepless nights worried about the problems in this world. And I, I don't know the answers. I don't. And it troubles me like you would not believe. I don't know the answers. I just know that when we read scripture and we look at who God is, God says, here's the answer. Love God and love people. God says it in the Ten Commandments, God says it in the prophets, and God says it through everything that Jesus does. Love God and love people. And one more thing, be sloppy with it. Just waste it. Waste love. Just drop it everywhere. The answers are hard and they're elusive and, and overwhelming. 
But the answer is also so simple. Love God and love people so much that you can't stand to see them hurting. Love people so much that what hurts them hurts you. Love people like God loves people. And when you do that, God will take care of the rest. Let us pray. Loving God, we ask your forgiveness for our stingy hearts, for hearts that are so focused on uh, judgment that we miss the opportunity for justice. Forgive us for the questions that we ask that don't draw us into deeper relationship with you and with each other, but rather create boundaries that impose restrictions on our love. Oh God, make us sloppy with grace. Make us stingy with judgment and abundantly generous with justice. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us what it means to follow Christ, to follow God, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As we come to the end of our um, service today, I invite you to listen to the stirrings of your heart how God might be calling you to respond. We have a new song, um, so I'll let Michael uh, tell us more about that. It's an old spiritual, old traditional. It's actually popularized and used as an anthem during the civil rights movement in the 60s. And there's about a hundred different versions of it. But. <laughs>
Beautiful song. Thank you for. Do we have Jennifer to thank for this one this week as well, or or, or Michael? Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer, for the. Uh, <laughs> The, Ten after midnight, he came upstairs and started figuring it out. Ten after midnight, uh, Michael began f f figuring this song out because his wife said, you, know, you don't have to do this, but it's a good one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and he's like, shoot, it is a good one. <laughs> and that, so, yeah, it's, it was great. Thank you. Thank you for your commitment, both of you. And thank you for being here and, and for being sloppy about grace because you are loved and there is nothing you can do about it. Thanks for worshiping with Ecclesia this week. We will see you next week. Thanks for being here.